Hello and welcome to Hurt Less, Live More, the show where we explore all the hurts that we might have experienced in life and, and look at ways that we've either got through it or ways that we could have got through them all. And I'm JJ, the Practical Alchemist. I'm here as ever with Dr. Mark Goulston, psychiatrist and coach. And we have a special guest today, don't we, Mark? We absolutely do. So uh, uh, let me mention, uh, Marcy Glidden Savage uh, was on my podcast, the My uh, my Wake Up Call, and she wrote a book called And Nobody Saw It Coming. And she's had two husbands who have died by suicide. And if I'm listening into this, uh, I, and if I met Marcy, I wouldn't know what to say. I mean, I don't know how that would come out in conversation. And before we started, Marcy said, yeah, I run into that a lot. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a show and game stopper when you meet people. And uh, uh, I may have shared this with you when you were on my wake up call, because I had a, a patient years ago whose only child was murdered. And when people say, do you have children? Uh you know, she goes into it, and they're so awkward. And so my advice to her was to, I guess, in pre-COVID days, you could touch someone on the shoulder to reassure them. And my advice to her was to say to these people, that's okay, because if I was you, I wouldn't know what to say either. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't know what to say either, Marcy. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and you were saying that, you know, that's the that's the response you get all the time from people all the time yes yeah quite extraordinary so i mean i i'm very curious to to find out how you get over such a thing because two husbands who committed suicide Mm -hmm. within five so five years between the two so that's that's a huge huge amount of grief to process in such a short space of time, how how are you still sitting there talking to us? How are you still standing? And also, what? How did you make the decision to come out and talk about it? Because yeah. a lot of people would would tuck it away and hope it doesn't even come out in conversation. So, so yeah. address both those things. Well, in short, um, I I gave myself permission to heal. Uh, I, I, you know, certainly had counseling for four or five years. Um, But what I realized is that a counselor, uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, friends, uh, family couldn't give me permission to heal. Mm. They were saying those things. I actually had to do it myself. I think a lot of um, people in grief get stuck in that um, place where they they just don't allow themselves to heal. They don't know how to heal. They don't feel right about healing when someone they've loved has uh, passed. But I, I think I just knew if I don't give myself permission to heal, I, I might not ever heal. And so I did, and that allowed me to um, do a lot of reading and, uh, you know, find ways to heal. And one of the, one of the most important ways for me was I I read Megan Devine's book and she gave a, a writing prompt to her students that I thought was just excellent. And it was uh, an exercise in personification. And, you know, she said, look, if you have a major character in your book, you know, you need to know what they talk, how they talk, how they sit, how they comb their hair, all those things. So, you know, the prompt was how did grief introduce himself or herself to you? And I thought, wow. Wow, great. That's amazing because now grief can sit over there in that chair 
and and I don't have to carry grief around. I can grief is always going to be with me, but I can talk to grief instead of just in my own head. And so um, by doing that exercise and writing down, you know, how, what I felt about grief the moment they showed up, I mean, the rage and the anger and go away. I don't want you here. This can't be real. To eventually my understanding that grief was the only entity that knew exactly how I felt at every, at every moment of my life. You know, I hid how I felt from my children, sometimes from my friends, uh, people that I would meet, but grief absolutely understood everything I was thinking and feeling. And, and so grief became a teacher and, and almost a companion and particularly so after this, my second um, husband passed. When when Paul died in 2014, we had been uh, engaged in the community, uh, had raised our, I mean, our kids and lots of friends, um, lots of activities. And so he was very beloved. You know, again, we had a 40-year romance from the age of 17 and he was 19. And so I was really kind of protected by um, people's real thoughts about his death. But when I remarried and it happened again, the anger was, I, I, I don't know that I've ever been in an environment that was so angry. And intellectually, I understood their anger. I would have been angry had it been my friend and her. And yet I got lost in the anger. My, my grief got lost, my loss of love, my, you know, and I felt like um, no one wanted to be quiet about how angry they were at him. And so um, grief really became my friend at that point. And um, I learned that um, I needed to show it for myself. This was my story, but it wasn't Marcy. It's Marcy's story, but it's not my character. It's not my, my intelligence. It's not my, the way I conduct my life. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with my ability to love, to be kind, to be compassionate. It's my story. And I'm not afraid of my story anymore. Um, I know I get those reactions. But what I ultimately would like people to see is that despite losing love and my life impl- imploding, I mean, completely changing. I was able to show up for myself and honor Marcy and her life. I mean, I have a quote right here. And if I might just read it, it's from Walter Anderson. And I'm sure you know it, but um, he wrote, although I may not be able to prevent the worst from happening, I am responsible for my attitude or the inevitable misfortune that darkens life. Bad things do happen. How I respond to them defines my character and the quality of my life. I can choose to sit in perpetual sadness, immobilized by the gravity of my loss, or I can choose to rise from the pain and treasure the most precious gift I have, life itself. And I read this in a magazine in my psychologist's office one day just picked it up waiting and read it and it it was it was a bit of a divine moment I think I mean it was a light bulb I thought well yeah uh I do need to embrace the change and embrace my life my life is worth living I'm worthy of it so in a nutshell 
That's kind of kind of what I've done over the past nine years. Wow. That's some journey, really. There have been a few times in my life when I have felt suicidal. A, a big part of it was a feeling of failure, feeling of humiliation, feeling of ashamed, feeling of embarrassed. And I'm not a religious person, but I, but I guess I thank God that uh, you know that I I pushed through. Um, you know, a, a story uh, that JJ knows, and maybe I shared it with you when you were on my podcast. And one of my low points was dropping out of medical school, and uh, and I think the head of the school was knowing that they wanted to kick me out, and he was afraid that I'd go off the deep end. And I, uh, so he sent me over to the dean of students who cared about students, and he hit me with the trifecta of hope when he told me that I was going to be kicked out, he said, uh, and I came from a background where you're only worth what you can do and accomplish. And if you can't do anything or accomplish anything, you're not worth anything. And not unusual male thing. I think, I think women often die or or from the pain of loss. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas for us, men, it's gets complicated with ego and that sort of thing. And what the uh, dean of students said is he said, uh, you're messed up, but you didn't mess up. I mean, you passed everything. And then he said, but even if you don't get unmessed up, even if you don't do anything with the rest of your life, even if you don't become a doctor, I'd be proud to know you. (laughs) And that was at a low point. And and I, I said, what? He said, I'd be proud to know you because you have something in you that the world needs, and you won't know it till you're 35, but you're going to make it till you're 35. And I was at the time probably 26, 27. And so he had sort of an unconditional love for me. I'd be proud to know you. What? Uh, uh, you won't know how much the world needs this thing that I see in you till you're 35. So he saw a future for me. And then I think the thing that he really did that probably was the linchpin to saving me, he said, but you've got to make it to your 35. You deserve to be on this planet, and you're going to let me help you. Because if he had said to me, call me if I can help you, I may have gone back to my, you know, apartment. I probably wouldn't have reached out, and, you know, there's a good chance I wouldn't be here. But uh, when he said, you're going to let me help you, it's like he grabbed me by the nape of the neck. Mm -hmm and said, you're not going anywhere. And I internalized that. Those three things, unconditional love, so I I couldn't screw it up, a future, and, you know, you look a little helpless right now, so I'm going to help you. And he arranged an appeal, and he, and he stood up against the medical school and said, uh, we're giving this one a second chance. And I internalized that. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I mean, it, it's almost like I died and was reborn. And again, I'm not a religious person, but those three things uh, is kind of what I did and paid it forward after I finished med- medical school, became a psychiatrist. And one of my focuses was suicide prevention. And, uh, but I can see if there was conditional love, like, what is wrong with you? You know, you know blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I, it would have just hammered me inside. And if, and if no one could see a future for me, if someone had rubbed my face in it, or I was rubbing my own face in it saying, you know, you're not worth very much. You know, you're not going to do much for the world. Uh, but he countered all of those. Oh, I, I believe that most, if not all men... <laughs> you know, uh, gather their self-esteem and their self-worth by what they're able to provide for their families or to society. And uh, unlike uh, women, you know, we have other, you know, we have girlfriends and we have children. We, we find it other ways. And, but men don't talk to each other like this 
wonderful man spoke to you. That is, uh, I'm not going to say it's a one-off, but it it is not usual. Therefore, men don't reach out when they're hurting. It's a sign of weakness and, and all of that. And I, I will say, when you've lost someone by this death, it's the only death, I believe, where your loved one's character, life, achievements are re-evaluated and re thought even though you've known the person for 58 years now you question did you really know them and you know that's for me that's wrong that's just unnecessary pain and so many assumptions are made as well when this happens and we'll maybe talk about that uh, a little later but we will go to a break right now We'll be back with much more after these messages from our station sponsors. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. And you're listening to Hurt Less, Live More here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio station. And I'm back again with Dr. Mark Goulston and Marcy Glidden Savage. And Marcy, we, I mean, your story is, is so powerful. Um, and I know that beyond just getting over it, what you're doing now is, is campaigning is the, the best word for it, I guess to remove the stigma that surrounds uh, suicides and and mental illness or or just depression and that kind of thing because there is still that that real stigma around anybody who confesses to being depressed being you know not being able to cope having issues with their mental health it's still there i believe it's the bottom line and i believe that until we as a society, as a world, realize that those stigmas are so archaic <laughs> centuries and centuries ago. Yeah. And and when the media will stop only portraying people that are that have struggles with mental health as, you know, mass shooters and yes. chaos all over the world, uh that we can do help. We can do uh, telethons. We can run races. We can garner funds. We can do all those things for uh, suicide awareness and prevention. But until we change the way as people we talk to each other, and I, I don't believe we're ever going to make big inroads. The stigma once you lose someone is no longer on them. They're not here to hear it anymore. The family is, the friends are, the colleagues are. And I just don't know anywhere in any death that it is acceptable, appropriate to question um, your loved one's loss and how. Um, I just can't imagine walking up to a friend of mine whose husband has cancer and saying to her, well, didn't you see that? D- didn't you see anything yeah. before? Uh, yeah. Why did you get him to a doctor sooner? Uh, are you, are you having uh, financial problems? You couldn't get help from a doctor. Just the unnecessary um, questions. And the, stigma of again both both my husbands were 58 years old they were very successful businessmen um they had a lot of anxiety because they they felt stressed to perform for their families and provide and um 
and they were well loved. They were told they were loved. They were shown they were loved. Um, they were a hero to their children. And yet they also were prescribed medications for depression, for not being able to sleep, for anxiety. And I I would say that both were also believed they had their own medical degree and could self-medicate themselves sometimes. And um, which can be easy to hide from a lot of people, even from the woman that you've slept with for, you know, over 34 years. Um, And I think that's not uncommon. My second husband, Michael, lost his vice president job uh, about six months before had been a uh, vice president of global uh, proportions in the uh, aerospace industry for 30 some odd years. Difficult to find a job of that nature uh, again at that age. Um, My first husband, Paul, had suffered prostate cancer four years before. And all that that in entails it's a very intimate cancer in a marriage and uh even though you know your partner your wife may uh, do everything in their power to work through those things you know it's it's a part of a I, i believe a male that you just can't you know talk they just can't express how they feel about that but it is certainly akin, I believe, to women who have breast cancer and have, you know, maybe their breasts removed. And so a a lot of things, uh, men in their, in their late fifties, and that's why there's such a big proportion outside of our youth that, um, unfortunately, uh, die by suicide. And, you know, to me, that's a manner of death. It's like a car accident or, or pneumonia when you have COVID or, or cancer. It, it's a manner of death. It's not what killed them, I don't believe. And, you know, when when we as a society can start talking about that as a real illness and not some bad, like crazy, you know, it, it just is what it is. It's like cancer. It's like Alzheimer's. It's got its own uh, symptoms and its own um, trajectory, and it, it can be undiagnosed, like skin cancer. I mean, it can, you know, it it's just an illness, and we need to treat it as that. And when we can, then I believe that we can give certainly more men permission to like talk about it. Tell it, tell your buddy. Tell your best friend, you know, um, and and not question, well, are you having financial problems or marriage problems? You got to be having marriage problems or is, is the job just too much for you? I mean, we don't question those things when somebody says, hey, man, I got cancer. Yeah, I, I completely resonate with what you're saying there as well. And even though I am not a man, I have suffered from depression and didn't talk about it you 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 don't talk about it you hide it what was i going to say did i know did anybody know how to deal with it did anybody know what how to respond i didn't think so i i used to say that i you know went down the steps to hell at one point uh and might not have come back mm-hmm. but somehow managed to drag myself back it's... I want to throw something out into the mix because uh, I'd never thought about this before, and uh, so it's it's half it's uh, half baked, and maybe we'll fully bake it. As we're talking about stigma, I'm thinking of four words: uh, helpless, powerless, useless, worthless. Helpless, powerless, useless, worthless. And and I and I'm wondering how much the stigma is 
that people, especially men, feel such an aversion to feeling helpless, powerless, useless, worthless, that they will do anything to avoid feeling it. You know, they'll drug themselves, they'll drink, they'll eat and whatever. And and I'm seeing how, especially veterans, you know, veterans have trouble reaching out. And a lot of times what they're feeling is helpless, powerless, useless, worthless. And I can see how if they're reaching out to a friend or a mental health professional, I think what they're actually wanting is for someone to, uh, there's a term, not just hold space, but they want, they want to feel felt by someone else. I, I had a supervisor, very smart, and he said, before you see a patient, you should do a, a mental health check about how you're feeling. Because if you're feeling okay, when you're with that patient, and you start to feel helpless, powerless, whatever, uh, they're wanting you to feel it so they don't have to feel it alone. Mm. And because there's something about uh, feeling alone with those things or feeling someone being, you know, a professional, but at a distant, and it makes you feel like an idiot for having opened it up. And one of the things he taught me, which was so elegant and eloquent, um, uh, you'd say when someone is help causing you to feel that way, what you might say to them is you're really doing a good job and they're going to go, what? They're not, what do you mean I'm doing a good job? And you say, you're really doing a good job of helping me to feel what it feels like to feel helpless, powerless, useless, and worthless. Mm-hmm. And it's so painful and I get to leave this office not feeling it, and you don't. Right. And I'm so sorry that it hurts so much. I do think there's a way through it. I do think there's even a way to get past it. But right now, I'm so sorry that you feel that way, because I'm just getting a taste of it, and it feels awful. Mm. And, I th- and it was, so, do, you, do you follow me, Marcy? It was so elegant. Yes. Uh, and now, some people who have such an aversion will say, well, that's unprofessional. Well, aren't you laying a guilt trip? No, no, it, it's it's being empathic at the, the most level because you're saying, I just felt what you felt and it feels awful. And I'm so sorry you you feel this way, which I think gives you an entry into them because, you know, you're not judging them, you're being compassionate. And then you can say just calmly, um, I know you don't see a way through this or past this. And in this moment, feeling what you feel, I don't see a way through it. But I'm here to tell you that there is a way through it. (laughs) There is a way to get through it. Because I've seen that happen hundreds of times right now. I'm so I'm so immersed in what you're feeling and how how much it hurts. I I can also feel like there's no way through it, but I'm here to tell you that there is. I wish I'd, I'd give anything really to um, have had any inkling at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after um, you know, loving someone the majority of my life I would have given anything to be there on his worst day, his worst day ever. Let me, you know, I, I would have given anything to have been there to have said anything to have held a hand. I mean, uh, oftentimes there's, you know, Kind of like, you know, you hear that people that are that are terminally ill with cancer, they'll have, they'll rally, right before, and and um, I believe that to be true with with uh, Paul. We had the most amazing weekend prior to that Wednesday. I mean, it was like we were kids again. I mean, we had. A wonderful time. In fact, we were at a concert and um, a young couple next to us, halfway through the, you know, leaned over and said, 
you know, how do you guys do it? And we, we, so what do you mean? He said, well, we, we don't know you, but clearly you guys are in love. And I just said, well, we never fell out of love on the same day, I guess. Um, I mean, we had a wonderful time, but the thing that worries me going forward is there's already such a lack of personal connection with the internet, with social media and, and all of that. I mean, we're, we're getting, we're, we're backing ourselves behind the eight ball even further. We need to be able to connect with each other. We need to be able to just lean in and, not as eloquently, certainly, um, Mark, as as your example, but I had a friend that lost a three-year-old. And, you know, I walked out of my house with my healthy three children. I grabbed a box of Kleenex. I walked down the street to her house, walked in the door, sat down and with my Kleenex and just said, I don't know how you breathe. I don't. That's all I can say, because I didn't know what else to say. But mm-hmm. at least she understood. I, I am, I'm, I'm hurting and acknowledging your hurt and your pain. Yeah, and she but would I, have understood that in, just being there. Yeah, leaning in. To yeah. The pain. Uh, I call in my book. I have a chapter on lean in heroes, how to lean mm. in, and what that looks like, and and little things that. Um, to lean in and not say, call me if you need me. <laughs> I actually said to a neighbor, I'm not going to call you. I'm just telling you that doesn't happen. You know, you're just going to have to show up. And But um, we have done a remarkable job as as a world, as a society, of changing our wrongs and righting our, our wrongs and our attitudes towards people whether it is the color of their skin, whether it is their sexuality, we, we, we haven't, we haven't conquered it. We haven't done a hundred percent great, but we've made remarkable uh, inroads into that. Yeah. So we can do it. We can. And, and until that stigma goes away, I mean, my children, my daughter didn't get help for five years because she did not want to walk into a psychologist's office and have to explain who her daddy really was. Uh, I mean, she wanted them to know the daddy that was always there. I mean, and not just the last day of his life. And then let's talk about healing you no she wants you know the whole story (laughs) know how wonderful he was and then try to heal me um i I don't want other people to go through that and i certainly you know i i see um, the first thing families want to do when the you know when a wonderful soccer player you know dies in california and a young one or or a miss usa or jumps off a building in new york the first thing the family is they were wonderful. They were smart. They were, you know, you're desperate for people to remember who they actually were and not this last few minutes of a life doesn't erase all that. But to everyone around us, it feels as though their lives were just erased. And this was it. This was their story now. So I, that's why I will speak and I will speak until my last breath about let's change this. Let's do better. We can. We can. We can. And you speak beautifully uh, about it, Marcy. Let's carry on talking about this. First of all, though, uh, let's just take a short break uh, to hear these messages from our station sponsors. We'll be back right after this with me, Mark and Marcy. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. 
the station that makes you feel good. And you are listening to Hurt Less, Live More here on UK Health Radio with me, JJ, the Practical Alchemist, Dr. Mark Goulston, and our guest today, Marcy Glidden Savage, author of And No One Saw It Coming. And, you know, we've been talking about stigma. And, uh, Mark, I mean, do you have any theories as to why the stigma isn't really going away as quickly as we might have hoped? Yeah. Um, well, we mentioned something earlier that, uh, uh, that if I, if I share with someone that I'm feeling helpless, powerless, useless, and worthless, um, it's, it actually feels contagious because they don't know what to say, you know? And, and what happens is even if they say something, I can feel, well, there, there, I've gone and burdened them. Mm. And, and the burden, I don't think, is that I share it with them. It's that they don't know what to say. And out of that anxiety, they throw solutions. Well, you should do such and such, which if you're the person sharing those things, you're smiling politely and you're thinking, why did I even open up about it? Mm-hmm. And I think what it is, is... If I'm there feeling suicidal, I feel helpless, powerless to make the pain go away. I just, I just, and and if I share with someone uh, that I'm feeling that and helpless and powerless, uh, I really think it is to cause them to feel it with me. I, I once heard a great quote: "Pain is pain." Suffering is feeling utterly alone in pain. Mm. And when you can lessen the aloneness in people, suffering they can't live with becomes pain they can. That's that's an excellent that's an excellent quote. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm sure this is this is a slight tangent, but we'll get back to it. Uh, <laughs> You know, I do executive coaching, you know. So out in the business world, Mm -hmm. there's been a stigma against me as a psychiatrist in the business world. And the reason being is you can be a psychologist, but that's because there's hundreds of psychologists. You can be organizational psychologists. You can be a performance psychologist. You can be whatever. And what people would tell me is they'd say, I can't refer anyone to you. Because when they look you up and they see you're a psychiatrist, they're going to say to me, what do you think? I'm crazy. Do you think I need medication? And it's an awkward conversation. Right. And and something I feel actually good about is I've actually joined a company called On Global Leadership, and I'm heading up their Deeper Coaching Institute. And the idea is that some people who have coaching – not only find out strategies, but they find out things about themselves that they never knew that really open doors and they might want to go deeper. But the majority of coaches who come from the business world can, you know, can sort of look into it and you can talk about your limiting beliefs and how it's not working for you, but you don't really go deeper. Right. So, uh, so I'm excited. Uh, I've changed my whole LinkedIn profile about this because it, it makes sense that, well, a psychiatrist, if, if there's someone in the mental health profession who's highly trained, they could probably go deeper. So mm-hmm. now I can stop hiding that I'm a psychiatrist in the business world because when people see deeper coaching and the way we explain it, mm-hmm. oh, so what'd you, what'd you find out about yourself that, uh, uh, here's a little tip that's, that may be relevant or irrelevant. But one of the things that a number of people find out about themselves is when you have good intentions, that doesn't make up for having a lousy way of interacting with people. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll see a number of parents and especially fathers who uh, 
can really come off as rough on their kids and the kids push back and feel injured and and the father doesn't get it well i don't wake up in the morning wanting to bully my children i want to help them be the best they can and i know how to be the best they can and i'm just telling them how to do it you know i don't know why they're so upset when i tell them how to do it the right way and my way cuz that'll make them successful like me <laughs> So so I have good intentions. I don't understand why people have a problem with me. And uh uh and and when people find out that good intentions don't make up for a way of coming across that puts people down. And that's exact <laughs> that is exactly how it feels when people are around me. They have good I don't think anybody has bad intentions, but I have certainly heard the word coward. Wow. Really? For both Uh-oh. of them. So, uh, mm. uh, yeah. And, and I intrinsically don't think that they have bad intentions. They ju- their delivery is horrific. I think with this particular type of death, people are just so frightened by it. They don't understand it. You know, they, they need the answers for why uh, you can't point to like a, in their mind, like cancer or heart attack or, you know, something like that. But their intentions, although good, cause pain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Losing someone is hard enough that you love anybody. It's hard enough. Grief sucks. Grief is hard. Grief is is just the last thing we we teach anything about. I mean, it's inevitable <laughs> worldwide, but we we don't have classes on how to deal with grief. Something yeah. I'd like you to elaborate on, uh, which I just recently learned, and I feel embarrassed that I really didn't get the nuance, but. I was recently reading up on the difference between grief and mourning Mm. and that, and that grief is the actual loss and the mourning is the beginning to heal by expressing your pain from the loss. Mm. And, and I, and I never saw that distinction, you know, and that's why various religions have a mourning period you know, and, and 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 I think it's a useful distinction. Uh, I found it that way that the grief is the loss just happened. You know, and, and I am grief stricken. I'm literally stricken with this. And the mourning is when we, as you said, I did. I gave myself permission to heal. So you gave yourself permission to mourn. Mm, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. So does that make any sense to you, Bernie? Well, I, I guess when I think in terms of mourning, I do think of m- more on a um, a constricted time frame. When I think mm. of the word mourning, mm. uh, b- because of uh, certainly religious aspects of that, um, I do a lot of volunteer and humanitarian work on uh, Native American reservations here. And certainly in their culture, there, there's a, a time of mourning, you know, cutting your hair, different things like that. And it's, but it's a time frame. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and as, as we know, grief is this yucky ball of just yuck that bounces this way and that way and up and down and back and forth. And, 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 and it, and it can hit you years later. You know, uh, even when you think you've done the best healing you can and then a song comes or you're at the beach or something happens and here it comes again. So I think of grief that way. Mourning is more, okay, wear black for a year. Okay, and then you're yeah, done. And then- that's a great, yeah, I, I like that because a, a, lot, a lot of people could feel guilty. Well, I thought you had the mourning period. Aren't you over yeah. it yet? So that's a great that's a great distinction, Marcy. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I tell people you're never going to get over it, but you can get past it. I mean, I think people grieving think 
I need to be over this by now. And when somebody finally, or I read some, uh, I think it was in a book, you're never going to get over it because you don't. But you learn to get past it and live with it and find joy again. But you never get over it. And I think that's another stumbling block for people is that their expectation of, you know, people saying you will get over it. Time heals all wounds, you know, just those platted platitudes and cliches, which are just exactly that and nothing more. Um, so I think that that's a stumbling block. So we are coming close to the end of the show um, at this point, but I'm curious, talking about religion, how much does the religious notion that suicide is a sin still hold sway today? Is that something that you think is is standing in the way of us accepting and and being more more tolerant? As Dr. Mark said earlier about kind of uh, someone asking you to kind of check in on what your feelings were. Okay. Um, I did a webinar with about 600 employees from a behavioral health um, company, frontline workers, uh, part of that 988 phone number uh, answering those calls. And what I said to them was, check your own attitudes and your own beliefs about suicide before you, you know, I mean, my great aunt used to say, you know, put it in your basket and walk around with it a bit Mm -hmm. because you're going to come to them with those attitudes and those beliefs about suicide. Now, for me personally, um, I have a big faith. And I know that the Bible has seven suicides in the Bible, not not just Judas, as everybody kind of thinks. Um, and and God is is um, relatively quiet on that subject. And so uh, for me, although one of the first things my pool guy said to me after my first husband passed, as I walked outside to say hello to him. Um, Instead of Marcy, how are you? Or, you know, he looked at me and said, do you think Paul's in heaven? Wow. It it was in that moment. I thought, oh, this is going to be a long journey. Yeah. If this is the first thing you want to ask me. And I don't know, um, JJ, I discovered my husband on our patio with a gunshot wound in his head. Oh. So I, not only the loss, there was, you know, certainly I could have said I have post-traumatic stress kind of over it. I mean, I couldn't even shut my eyes for a couple of days because that's the only vision I saw. Um, so knowing that and then some and then someone just asked, that's the question they want to ask me. I think that that has everything to do with how we're raised and and beliefs of the past and and all of that. But it's again, it's it's just like we've been raised around the world. There are there are prejudices that we've been raised with, whether it's about race, religion, uh, gender, all of that. Yeah. We and yet that. we're willing to do better. We're willing to be better people and learn from each other and and understand that. You know, we can all be different, but we're all human beings. Bottom line, we have that in common. We're just human beings. We all love. We all have hate sometimes. All that stuff. But when we can just lean into each other and listen, just listen. We don't have to solve your your problem. But if I can listen to you, and you know I'm listening. Well, Marcy, thank you so much thank for you. everything. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. We are right at the end of the show now. Yeah, I think you, you, you've you really inspired me, and I know Mark feels the same way. I'm sure I'm not speaking I, I feel really turn. touched. Where, where can people find out yeah. more? Well, Mar- MarcySavage.com. I have a website, and, and there's some other um podcast they can listen to that I've done um you know and article I wrote in the Huffington Post and you know a few things and um 
and reach out to me there. I, my mission is to tell my story and I tell my story with a smile on my face and um, a resilience that um, you know you can get past hurt and bad things and if you show up for yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much. And on that note, it is time for us to go. So from me and Mark and Marcy, goodbye. We hope you'll join us again another time here on Hurt Less Live More. Bye for well, now. Bye.